Hello, I'm Trudy Loban, founder of Arrhythmia Alliance, the heart rhythm charity, providing information, support, education and awareness for all those affected by SVT, whether that's the patient, the carer or the healthcare professional. We're launching a series of living with SVT so that we can understand what are the symptoms, what are the causes, what are the treatment options and what are those treatments in detail and how we can improve our quality of life if we're living with SVT. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Jared Bunch from Utah University School of Medicine. He's joining us today as part of our SVT pioneers, and he's going to present about what are the causes and symptoms of supraventricular tachycardia. Dr. Bunch, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we very much look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you to the Arrhythmia Alliance for this opportunity to share with you today and talk about living with uh, SVT. What are the causes? What are the symptoms? And answer any questions that you may have as, as, as you try to understand this and, and, and how you feel and what are the options. So I wanna talk first about the heart in general, what normal function is. And our heart begins with what we call the sinus node. And it's up in the high right upper chamber of the heart. It's really the pacemaker uh, organ of the heart. And it elevates with our heart rate when we're exercising, anxious, uh, excited, and it helps slow our heart rate down when we're sleeping and eating. And, the electrical wave front that propagates from the sinus node that covers both of the upper heart chambers. Next, after this wave front leaves the sinus node, it reaches a second structure, which is important, called the AV node or the atrioventricular node. And this is what I consider the relay center of the heart, where information is conducted like water down a drain to the bottom of the heart. Otherwise, the electricity would stop when it hit these valves. And just like the sinus node, the AV node allows uh, conduction to go faster when we're exercised, anxious, stressed, excited. And it also slows when we're sleeping or eating. And these become really the two critical aspects of the conduction of the heart. And then after the AV node, through long bundles called the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch, depending on which side of the heart they arise on, it, the electricity is released in the bottom of the heart. So it's they squeeze from the bot, the, the chambers squeeze from the bottom up. So this is what it looks dynamically, an impulse that starts up here in the sinus node, it crosses to the left side, then it's channeled through the middle of the heart to the AV node and down. And what we call the electrocardiogram is the manifestation of this in this graphical form. This first beat, the P wave, represents the, represents the electrical conduction of the upper chamber. And then when electricity is coursing through the middle of the heart, it's in these insulated fibers. And so this uh, deflection becomes flat. And then what we see afterward is the QRS and the QT intervals that represent electricity covering the bottom chamber and the bottom chamber electrically recovering. And the, the bottom chambers are so much larger and thicker, they give a bigger uh, deflection on this. And so this is what we call the electrocardiogram. It can be named electrocardiogram EKG, or if we use the, uh, the prior nomenclature electrocardiogram, it could be EKG if it represents that. So both mean the same thing. So let's talk about supraventricular tachycardia now that we understand what normal conduction is. And typically, this is an abnormally fast heartbeat involving the heart's upper chambers, typically greater than 100 beats a minute. Uh, abnormal heart rhythms are also what we call arrhythmias. So sometimes you'll see this word used in, in addition. And an SVT uh, can, al can also be called paroxysmal. What paroxysmal means is that it comes and goes. So it can be a paroxysmal arrhythmia, meaning an abnormal heart that comes and goes. A supraventricular tachycardia, meaning a heart rate from the upper heart chambers. Remember, they're separated electrically from the lower heart chambers, except for that little AV node, and typically over 100 beats. 
so many. So what are the, some of the common symptoms? Well, these can include a racing of your heart or a rapid heart rhythm, palpitations, fluttering or pounding of your heart, chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness and lightheadedness. Rarely do people pass out, but people that have a baseline low blood pressure sometimes can and then a pounding feeling in your neck. And it's important to realize we all fill our heart differently. Our nervous systems are very precise in some aspects and not as precise in others. For example, all of us, uh, if we touch a hot stove with our finger, we'll know exactly which part of our finger we touch the hot stove with. But the way we feel our internal organs is really different. And I may have chest pain where you may have shortness of breath, where your friend may have dizziness, or palpitations. Some people will call the emergency services in the United States 911 if the first time they get this and other people can walk in the office and be unaware that they're in this rhythm. So having different symptoms is part of this and understanding what's abnormal for you is also part of this as well. And then also you could feel weakness, fatigued, and tired. So let's talk about common types of supraventricular tachycardia. The first is what we call AV node. Remember at the AV node is that relay center in the middle of the heart, reentry tachycardia. And here's the sinus node. And what this AV node has is it has these many branches that go out and rapidly collect the electrical information to bring it down to the lower heart chambers. And some people between two branches, um, what we call the fast pathway and slow pathway, but they're just branches of this AV node, you can de develop a short circuit between the branches. And that's the most common type of uh, SVTs that we see. Uh, the next is what we call AV reentry tachycardia or AVRT, or this was abbreviated AVNRT. And what this is, is a little bit different. If you remember when I first showed the normal heart, I said that these valves separate the heart electrically and mechanically. And so electricity was forced to go down the middle of the heart. Now in some people, there can be a little muscle band that's on the outside of these valves that, elects, that allows electricity to get back up. So electricity goes down, comes up the bottom chamber and then as a way to slip through and come back around again. And this can occur in this direction, or it can also occur in the other direction where electricity goes down the pathway and up the normal conduction system. And we call this AV reentry tachycardia. And this is also common, but much less common than this rhythm. And there is a little bit of a sex difference in these rhythms. Women tend to have this a little bit more than men. Uh, and both these rhythms can occur early in, in life. And then, uh, and then also rarely as we get older. And then finally, another one is where we have an area of the heart that just decides to beat on its own. Like the, sin the sinus node was designed when we were born to create an electrical impulse to, to govern the heart. Sometimes the whole heart is electrically active. If we take biopsies of the heart and put them in put the cells in dishes, these cells have the ability to beat on their own. Sometimes there's areas in the heart that try that begin to do this. And when it's a focal uh, beginning of a abnormal heart rhythm, rhythm, rather than one of these short circuits, we call that atrial tachycardia. So these comprise the three most common forms of supraventricular tachycardia. There's a few others that are uh, largely different representations of these, but when your doctor sees you, these are the things that are in mind when we're considering it. Now, one of the important things to realize that these first two, these pathways, these are things that you're born with. You're born with when your heart was being formed, this extra pathway on the valve, and these can be anywhere along the valve, it was present. And people that have branches of the AV node that tend to be a little bit longer and have the ability to recover and come around um, are tend to be more conducive to these short circuits. So these are things that, we're, that you're born with. Why they change in life is what we're going to talk about next. And that's because that's 
because these don't start on their own. They're triggered by other things in the heart. So that's why you can be fine for a number of years and all of a sudden be diagnosed with something, even though you were born with the tendency. The second one tends to be more, it can, you can be born with cells that like to beat abnormally, but more often this is acquired. Something irritates the heart in one of these areas or they're in a unique area of force of the heart where veins come into muscle, muscles crisscross, muscles run in the valve. These areas of unique force in the heart over time sometimes raises the risk of this. So this rhythm can both be something you're born with, but more often it's something you're, you acquire over time with aging or aging with other heart problems. So what are the triggers? What sets this off? And that's what we call extra beats. And they, if they're from the upper chamber, we call them premature atrial complexes or PACs. From the bottom chamber, premature ventricular complex or PVCs. And we all experience these. But what happens in people with these short itch circuit tendencies, these extra beats occur and then the short circuit develops. And many times people with a supraventricular tachycardia will say, oh, I could feel it start. My heart flip-flopped and then it started. And that's often because they're feeling this extra beat and then their mind over time recognizes that that was at the right time to cause the short circuit. So what causes these extra beats? Well, most types of heart disease, heart failure, lung problems, consuming stimulants like energy drinks, caffeine, Something that I see very commonly is poor sleep, uh, whether that's obstructive sleep apnea at night, whether you're stressed and can't get sleep, or whether you suffer from insomnia. Many kids going to the university stay up all night drinking energy drinks to study for a test, get poor sleep, and then they feel their heart skip. And if they have a, a, a short circuit, superventricular tachycardia. Drug use. Uh, uh, can cause this as well, particularly stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamines. Pregnancy, because the heart and the body is going through a lot of changes. There's elevated volume of, uh, that have to feed the baby and the mother. This puts unique stresses on the heart. Smoking, thyroid problems, and certain medications often that have drugs that are similar to stimulants <clears throat> like asthma medications, allergy drugs, uh, um, decongestant, things like that. And, and people that have common short circuits often start to create a diary saying, what did I do? Um, it, it may be on this list and, and try to avoid it. So um, now what can cause the heart to develop atrial tachycardia? Well, what, uh, where the heart can start beating on its own. And what happens is our heart over time when it's exposed to things, Will begin to stretch and dilate and you start to get these areas of fibrosis and scar now and scar doesn't conduct electricity and so when electricity hits it it starts to move around it and cause these electrical eddies and areas next to scar are, are exposed to unique forces and can beat on their own so we want to avoid these things to really help the electrical conduction be uniform so just like before heart failure chronic lung disease, chronic exposure to stimulants, chronic exposure to poor sleep, untreated, undiagnosed sleep apnea, drinking too much. Some of the uh, heart conditions we see were initially called holiday heart because people would drink a lot. It could be a trigger and a toxic, uh, a toxic reagent to the heart and it can cause heart injury. Drug use, smoking, thyroid disease untreated, but really important and common in our society, particularly in westernized countries, is inadequate control of blood pressure. We need our heart, our blood pressure below 120 on top, systolic blood pressure, and below 80 on the bottom, diastolic blood pressure. Inadequate control of diabetes, inadequate control of an understanding of early diabetes, and obesity. Throughout the world, obesity rates are going up in developed and underdeveloped countries. And with that come all these other heart disease. And the heart's a barometer of that. And we see more of these, these abnormal heart rates. So I want to wrap up with this slide and introduce, I think, what is an excellent program for many of my colleagues here at the University of Utah. 
what's the pillars of treatment of supervention for impacted tachycardia? First, we need to diagnose it. We need to correlate your symptoms with a, an arrhythmia. There are things in which we feel our heart to be abnormal that aren't a supervention for tachycardia. We can feel the, the stress of the heart, the force of the heart. And sometimes we feel what feels like an abnormal rhythm is a normal rhythm and it's responding to high blood pressure or something else. So we want to get what we call, like I showed you an electrocardiogram or a, a, a tracing of the heart that says, this is what your heart rhythm is during symptoms. We want to identify triggers. And we talked about those and if possible, stop or eliminate them. And, and sometimes in some people that can help treat superventricular tachycardia and minimize need of any other treatments, whether they're medicine or non-medicine based. We, we want to consider medical therapies that reduce the triggers and also slow the heart rate down. Our heart can tolerate a fast heart rate for a while, but if you're in a superventricular tachycardia for hours, and if you have other heart disease, sometimes shorter, then the heart can begin to fatigue and inflame. So we use medical therapy to help reduce the rate and control. And then when that's not sufficient, also correct the rhythm and make it more normal. We have new ablative therapies that can be a curative approach with those things that you're born with, those extra pathways. Uh, those can be mapped out, treated either with a coolant injury or a heat injury, and, the, and it can be cured What's important after ablation is to remember the triggers may still be there. So sometimes people feel like it's going to start, but it doesn't after an ablation. It just takes a while for the, the mind and the body to, to recognize that the short circuit's no longer there. And finally, critical to all this is lifestyle modification. Remember the scarring of the heart is that the, the heart is a barometer for systemic health for our body health. And if we don't, if we're not serious about our weight, our activity, our sleep hygiene, our blood pressure control, our diabetes control, other areas can develop. And even though you've had one rhythm that's treated, you can develop another without attention to some of these. And inclusive in that is also reduction and, and stress and a reduction in alcohol uh, intake really to improve your longevity and your quality of life in other way. And each of these we'll talk about specifically in this conference. Thank you very much. Dr. Bunch, thank you so much. And we're now joined by your colleague as well, uh, Dr. Ben Steinberg. Welcome, uh, Dr. Steinberg, thank you. Uh, such an excellent presentation, very few questions because you covered most of the questions that have been submitted, but I know Sam, you have a, a few questions from our patients, haven't you? I do. Um, you mentioned both pregnancy and then also you mentioned that were, there were some SVTs that were more common in women than in men. Is there a hormonal correlation between with SVTs and hormones? That's a great question. And again, that, that first rhythm we talked about, AVNRT, is the most common, and it's slightly higher in women than men. Uh, and AVRT, uh, the second one we discussed, uh, has, is less common, but the, the, the ratio of men to women is a little different, and men are a little bit more common to have that. What we know is with the, the main sex hormones, women, progesterone and estrogen, they can affect those, the conduction properties in the middle of the node. Remember, I showed a few pathways, the slow pathway and the fast pathway. And when we think about short circuits, the best way to visualize them is a dog chasing its tail. And if the dog ever catches its tail, it stops. Uh, and, and some of the, the sex hormones, when they're very high, can slow the conduction through one pathway. And that makes it a little bit harder for the pathway to catch its tail and stop. And, but what I have found in my practice is that sometimes it can happen in women with menses and sometimes during ovulation. So women can be uniquely susceptible to one versus the other at, uh, at times of ovulation. In pregnancy, throws a number of different uh, hormones in the mix as well, plus all the fluid. In men, um, we don't typically see that as much, but there is a lot of movement in the United States for what we call vitality clinics. And, and so you can go and be assessed in people that have low testosterone, they give supplementation to make it high normal or just slightly high. And those, um, 
in a high testosterone can Im impact the fluid in the body. It can, it can increase the wall thickness of the heart and you can start getting some of the triggers as well, those PACs and PVCs uh, with that. And so we don't quite see it in the normal ranges, but we do see it with supplementation, both through medical clinics, but also some people are able to get supplementation in other ways outside of medical care. Thank you. Um, so when would you advise seeking emergency treatment during an SVT episode? As, we, as I mentioned initially, most people don't pass out, but if you're severely dizzy and you're passing out, that tells us that you're either your blood pressure, your heart's not tolerating this. Um, and if we see people that get in trouble when they feel a little bit dizzy and they think I'm just going to drive home first, or I'm gonna just go down the, the stairs first, if you're feeling dizzy and lightheaded, you need to get down and get and seek some help. Our heart will tolerate a fast heart rhythm when we're young and healthy for a number of hours. But if these are going, if the rhythm's going on and you don't have a lot of symptoms and you're three to four hours into it, then you also should seek care. Now, people that have heart disease, they've had stents or have had long standing high blood pressure or a bypass surgery, that window is shorter. Uh, and, and that becomes apparent when we look at marathon runners. And if you take marathon runners that are really healthy and they're running you know, over 20 miles and you measure markers of protein of heart injury, what we call troponin, those are up in marathon runners. And so with the supraventricular tachycardia, and that's because their heart's up for two hours. With the supraventricular tachycardia, your heart can stay up for a number of hours. And the same thing can happen even if it's healthy, it can start to inflame and become injured. So if you're multiple hours into this and it's not stopping on its own, then you probably should seek care. Dr. Steinberg, I'm going to ask you a question that has been submitted. Um, can SVT weaken my heart and shorten my life expectancy? That is a real concern of many of uh, the people registering for this event. Yeah, thank you. This is a, this is a question we get, <clears throat> excuse me, quite commonly. Um, and I think really what we're talking about is classic SVTs. I think Dr. Bunch and others have outlined is a specific subgroup of arrhythmias separate from things like atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. Those are other arrhythmias that are separate from this question. And when we're talking about classic SVT, um, the short answer really is no, um, is that in, in my clinic, you know, one of the biggest messages I try to convey um, is that despite the fact that often these arrhythmias feel like they could be fatal or extremely bothersome, traditionally they in general do not impact longevity. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, there are very, very small, very few you know, special circumstances where that, that may, be, may be different, but, but by and large, these arrhythmias are arrhythmias of, of relatively young, otherwise healthy people. Um, that don't really uh, convey any significant structural abnormality of the heart. Certainly we can see them in patients with other heart problems, but by virtue of just having this arrhythmia does not usually mean there's any other problem with the heart. And as Dr. Bunch, I think has outlined, often is related to a, to a small connection that, that people were born with and, and many people may have. And so the short answer to the question is, is no. And for that reason, in my clinic, frequently the conversation is focused around the patient preferences for treatment and, and how bothersome the symptoms are. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, also, Dr. Steinberg, are there any other conditions that mimic SVT? That's also a great question. And I think it gets to this question of patient experience and patient symptoms. So most patients with SVT experience a sense of palpitations or heart racing. We see that uh, in other conditions, certainly other arrhythmia conditions, and so it's important to, to have a diagnosis for what is contributing to that sensation, especially if it's an arrhythmia, uh, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well. Um, but other patients have a sensation of breathlessness or fatigue when they're doing things, and those symptoms um, can be much less uh, specific, if you will, and, and certainly can reflect other heart problems or uh, problems with the lungs or even other diseases. Um, and so in the subset of patients who have these kind of less specific symptoms, um, it, it can. And, and that's why 
um, one of the more important things is, is primarily to get a diagnosis. Thank you. And a final question for Dr. Bunch. Can stress or emotions trigger SVT? And, and what would you say, you know, to try and remain calm when you are experienced? You know, there, we have a, an online forum and so many people, it brings on a feeling of panic and anxiety. Um, you know, does stress cause the SVT or does SVT cause the anxiety? Is it a chicken or egg? And I think it's a bit of both. But what, what can people living like that, what can they do to try to stay calm and, uh, and try to help the SVT go away, I guess? That's a great question. And it's hard when your heart's going fast and it feels like it's beating out of your chest and to, to, to be calm. And it, it can be a trigger. And as we talked about, uh, one of the things I see, particularly with whatever it is, family stress, job stress, training stress if you're not sleeping well if you're not exercising if you're not hydrating if you're not eating correctly all those can cause those triggers and some and sometimes when we're feeling tired and fatigued then people turn to coffee and energy drinks or a lot of tea to try to get through the day and and that can stimulate the heart it can be a a, a cycle that can be tough to break when you're in a fast rhythm the best thing to do is you you need less blood pressure to lie down than to stand up and not feel dizzy. And so what we have people do is try to slow their heart down by doing things that help slow the middle of the heart, what we call a Valsalva maneuver. And the way you do that is you lie flat, and you put your legs up on a chair or, uh, or a couch or a sofa and lift them up. And then I have people take their smartphone because it's important to know or, or their watch and the, the time when your heart's fast because everything seems longer than it is. And then take a big deep breath and then bear down and hold it for five seconds while they're watching their phone and then repeat that. And if that doesn't stop it, also take very deep breaths. And, and, and that helps to kind of center yourself. And, and whenever you do that bearing down, it slows the heart down. And that can also break some of that fast sensation that drives some of the stress. But some people can just stop it by deep breathing. Again, things that naturally slow the heart, as we talked about at the beginning of, of, of my presentation, those things impact conduction through these abnormal pathways and they can help slow things down. Thank you so much. And I'm sure that will be really, really helpful information. Dr. Bunch, thank you for your presentation. So our next distinguished uh, speaker will be speaking on the diagnostics for supraventricular tachycardia SVT. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Lina Pong Navarro. I'm one of the cardiac electrophysiologists here at the University of Utah. So at our clinical centers, we are treating patients with supraventricular tachycardia. And I have to say thank you very much for the Arrhythmia Alliance. Allow me to participate in such a great educational virtual conference. And I hope this talk would be very helpful to everyone who would like to learn about the SVT. So my topic is about diagnostics for supraventricular tachycardia patients. I have no conflict of interest related to this talk. So the most common diagnostic test, once we as a physician see the patient, discuss with the patient and perform a physical examination, the most common test to be done next step is electrocardiogram. As you can see, this ECG is captured from a patient who presented to the hospital with a symptoms of palpitation and racing heart. And we found the regular fast heart rate at the heart rate almost 200 beats per minute. And with this, this is uh, help us to see and help physicians like us to diagnose the patient with supraventricular tachycardia. Though this is the most common diagnostic test that we order and perform on the patients. However, as we are aware, the symptoms of SVT are sometimes comes and goes as intermittent. The moment that you come to see physicians, the ECG might be in a complete normal rhythm. But when you leave the 
hospital or when you leave the office, you might have the symptoms of palpitation. So that's why aside from the 12 lead ECG that's performed in the hospital or in the physician's office, sometimes we do other longer term monitor. So we get that to the patients so that we can help and see when patient is back you know, in their routine daily activity, how often that the patient has symptoms and whether or not the symptoms are correlated with the supraventricular tachycardia. What are those devices? So the most common devices are cardiac halter monitor, cardiac event monitor, mobile cardiac telemetry, and ECG patch monitor, or sometimes we implant a device called a loop recorder for the patients. And we will talk about some of these devices next. So these uh, figures are from the publications in Journal of American College of Cardiology. As you can see, the figure on the left is the standard halter monitor. There were three sticky pads area that put on the chest wall connecting to the wire and it's connecting to the box. These could record a couple of days of information of the heart ECG rhythm or some device currently can record longer. And once you complete the, the duration of monitoring, you mail the package of this device back to the device company and they will analyze the ECG and give us the report about how in percentage of time, what is your heart rate in percentage of time that you are in supraventricular tachycardia or the abnormal rhythm. The second one in the middle is a modification of the first one where all the areas that monitor the ECG, this is in the form of an ECG patch where it just put on the chest in one area and the current version of these device, some of them were actually waterproof. That means once you have this device placed on for a certain duration that the physicians order, you might be able to continue your daily activity. Some of these devices are capable of having a live transmission of the patient's heart rhythm. On the other hand, some companies still have the patients collect all the information to the end of the study, mail the package back, and they analyze all the rhythm. The picture on the right is a sample pictures of a device called mobile cardiac telemetry. This mobile cardiac telemetry, as you can see, or even external loop recorder, as you can see, there are types of uh, electrode pads connecting to the wire and connecting to the box. And there was a transmitter device, which some company also used the current generation of the smartphones, where the information from here can send to this and use this cellular data or some form of wireless communication to send information in almost real time to the device company so that uh, these are the three common modalities that we prescribe to the patient these days. However, the current generation of the device might not be as big as this one. And there are uh, several new generations that come in the form of small external patches that could also collect the data or has the capability to send the information in almost instantaneous or real time. What about the non-medical prescription type of device? As you can see on these two, these are the smart tech ECG monitor from one of the companies where you can actually buy this commercial available device. You can put your fingers from the left and the right hands and this device connect to the smartphone and you can record your rhythm or in this figure is of course, it's a smartwatch or Apple watch that you can actually use one of your hands to touch the knobs and you can record the ECG. So these are of course commercially available and the patient could purchase. The one on the right though is actually uh, not commercial available to the patients to buy, but this is the one of the device called a loop recorder. As you can see, this is a very small device it's implanted subcutaneously under the skin in the left anterior chest wall or in the left 
a little bit more to the side of the chest wall in the area called anterior axillary position. Both of these are placed under the subcutaneous tissue. This device called implantable loop recorder that's also served as an electronic ECG monitoring for the patients. And aside from the rhythm diagnostic information that we offer to the patients, sometimes we also order other tests such as a stress test, an echocardiogram, or electrophysiologic study. So stress test, sometimes we do order it when we would like to see whether or not if there is evidence of exercise that could trigger the arrhythmias. If some patients feel the symptoms of significant palpitation or heart racing when they are physically active, exercise stress test could be helpful and sometimes it could help screening for coronary artery disease. Echocardiogram is also another very helpful test. It is non-invasive. It used the probe with the ultrasound capability that will place on the chest wall in multiple areas to obtain the image of your heart that created by the sound wave and create into a three or two or three dimensional these days of the heart chambers. And the echocardiogram can help physicians to see any structural abnormalities of your heart, such as the valve, the heart function, the heart relaxation, the heart contractions. Electrophysiologic study is an invasive test that we perform, and usually it performs in combination with the plan to perform catheter ablations. The electrophysiologic studies involve insertion of catheters through the femoral veins or sometimes internal jugular veins into the patient's heart. Multiple catheters will be placed in multiple locations in the heart to record the electrical signal inside the heart. And once the electrical catheters has been placed inside the heart, uh, we can record electrical signal. We can perform low energy electrical stimulation to the heart to help see and identify or induce the arrhythmias that the patients have. And then if we could identify the SVT that the patients had, then the next step, then the physicians who perform this electrophysiologic study can pursue the ablation of the SVT. And again, electrophysiologic study is considered an invasive test and it usually performed in the same studies or as part of the electrophysiologic SVT ablations. Additionally, aside from this, sometimes we may want to check several blood tests, including routine CBC, routine blood chemistry, and also thyroid function tests to make sure that we don't have any other possible triggers that could be treated uh, without having to perform any uh, electrophysiologic study or ablation. And thank you very much, everyone, for participating in this uh, talk, and I do really appreciate Arrhythmia Alliance to allow me to participate in this good conference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was absolutely excellent explaining the, the all the various detection. Um, just a couple of questions we've had submitted. You mentioned an implantable loop recorder. Mm. Is this the same as an implantable a, a cardiac monitor? Some people refer to it as an ICM rather than an ILR. Yeah, I think both of them are similar. It's actually, in, in my experience, these things are the insertable device and it's just, you know, one, way, one word or the other that, you know, it's the same. And the current generation of the loop recorder, as we saw in the image, is very small. It is very easy to insert, even though it may require making a small incision, but given the device itself is very small and it's only under subcutaneous tissue. It takes only a local numbing medicine, does not require intravenous sedation, and the insertion is usually quick. We need the patients, when the patients come into the procedure room, we prep the patients in the area on the chest by cleaning with antiseptic solution. And sometimes 
for a patient with hairy chest, we just need to shave the area. Once the skin is clean, we put the drapes on into the area to make the feel clean and sterile. We, as a physicians, we perform it with the gowns and gloves and of course the mask and the, the cap to cover our head. And then we numb the skin, make a small incision. The insertion part of the device is very quick. And for most adults, we put in the anterior of the chest wall slightly towards the left side of the breastbone or the sternum. The figure that I show is sometimes in pediatric populations, they might want to insert a little bit more lateral compared to adult, but regardless, it's a quick, easy procedure, really low risk. You said subcutaneous, that means just under the skin, just in, oh. yes. Yeah. Correct, yes. And um, for the ILR, it's so tiny, it's, it can almost sort of be injected in, I mm -hmm. believe. Um, and and no, no real scar being left afterwards. So I think the scar, even though if there is a scar, the incision is very small. So some people, it, it also depends on the skin or wound healings of the individuals. But even that, the scar is very small. And sometimes when we place in the lower part of the left anterior chest wall, sometimes the scar might not be seen because it's lower enough sometimes. And it usually, most of the time, I don't see cosmetic as a big issue for implantable loop recorder. And as you said, there's a numbing agent or a local um, antiseptic, uh, anesthetic. And um, how long does that stay there? How long, you know, is it months, years? So the estimated battery longevity is it's about three years or so two to four years these days. Um, usually for the people with supraventricular tachycardia, we put it until, we, we usually put it in the patients who has a symptom suggests SVT related to syncope. So that's one of them. We just want to make sure if a person come to us with passing out and also concern for SVT, any other things aside from SVT that we as a physicians need to be concerned about, one thing. Second thing is also for people who doesn't have symptoms so often, because usually if you have a symptoms of daily, once a couple of weeks, once a month, sometimes the external non-insertable monitor might be suffice to be able to detect the arrhythmias. However, for people who doesn't have that often, maybe they have symptoms once every six weeks, couple of months, for example, maybe a couple of times a year, sometime with such a less frequent of the symptoms, implantable loop recorder, which would, would make it easier for the patients rather than put the external monitor on, take it off, put the external monitor on and take it off. Insertable monitor, once we got the diagnosis, then we can discuss with the patients about starting the treatment, which there will be another session to talk about either medication procedures such as ablations, or we can uh, ex continue to observe. It will be up to the patients and physician discussions. And after we receive the diagnosis, we could discuss with the patients regarding, we now know the diagnosis that we can actually take it off or we can just, you know, continue to monitor until the end of its battery life to see if we can catch any other type of arrhythmias. Is it as easy to extract as it is to insert? Is it again a local anesthetic and it's in extracted that way or? So most of the time the, the extraction or the removal of the device is easy. Most of the time it does require the use of, again, local anesthetic agents and the surgical blade to cut the area opening. So once you insert the device in the human body, it forms the capsule of scar around the device. So we cut through the skin. So after we numb the skin, we cut through the scar, we cut through the capsule that formed by the fibrosis around the device and use the tools to take it out. Most of the time, it is quite easy. Sometimes we may require the use of fluoroscopy to help us localize the device in the patients who might have a 
large soft tissue on the chest area, but most of the time, it is very easy to putting in and also taking it out. How long does it take to insert? So to put it in, probably start from the clean and prep the skin. We wait about 30 seconds and we put the drape on. Then we start numbing. I think probably five, even 10 minutes and patient for insertion patient does not require the use of intravenous sedation. So really, you know, from, from first sitting there uh, or lying there, it's five to 10 minutes. And then what about when you need to take it out? How long does that normally take if, all, if it's all very straightforward? Normally it's about the same when it is superficial there's, there's enough. No need, there's no need to stay in hospital. There's no overnight stay, um, you know, life carries on. Correct, yes. And it's monitoring the rhythm of your heart 24 seven and hopefully you can capture the episodes uh, leading to a diagnosis. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. You mentioned um, about, you know, mobile apps. You showed one of the companies with the, you put your fingers on the electrodes, you showed a watch. How does, you know, the person in the street know which one to purchase? There are so many on the market and we always say they need to be medically approved by the FDA or in the UK, it's nice or whatever the regulatory body is in the country. How, how can somebody know, you know, what is the best one to buy if they choose to go down that route? Usually the one that already approved by the FDA or the NICE were probably have good decent qualities that you could record. But again, the, the point that I would like to make on that is that device will help you detect the arrhythmias only when you have the symptoms to use the device. So the, the, the beauty or the nice things about the medically prescribed device like halter, event monitor, implantable loop recorder, so on and so forth, where mostly we can capture your rhythms all the time during the time that you have that monitor place. For this commercially available that you could buy, the qualities of the signal has been improved a lot and uh, Sometimes when the patients capture the rhythm related to the symptoms and they show to us, we can actually take that and save it in our medical records and use as long as we review and looks like this is a good quality. However, uh, there are times that, you know, we busy doing something else, we forget to bring the device with us and those things also could miss the opportunity to diagnose the problems. However, generally speaking, the quality of the signal this day has improving a lot to help diagnose the symptomatic episodes of the arrhythmias or to help debunk the symptoms episode with some symptoms that the patients have may or may not related to arrhythmias. Thank you. I think that will answer most of the questions for those that have intermittent SVT and it's very hard to capture. They now know that there are other options available. Mm -hmm. um, but for those that are aware of the symptoms and are just trying to find out what is wrong, they can almost take it into their own hands if they wish to mm -hmm. um, have one of these uh, devices that they can purchase and monitor and then use that to show their, their clinician. And, and I, it's so important that people get the diagnosis and the correct di diagnosis yes. so that then appropriate treatment uh, is discussed. Thank you so much for your time. We know how busy our clinicians are, but thank you so much for sharing the wide range of diagnostic tools available to help people that may or may not have symptoms, um, but know, that, you know there's something that, that there is a choice to help with the diagnosis. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Trudy and Samantha, and thank you so much, Arrhythmia Alliance, for allowing me to participate in this great sessions. And I hope all the audience would learn something from the talk today about the help in management and diagnostics of SVT. Thank you. 
Welcome to Dr. Ravi Ranjan, Professor of Medicine and uh, Clinical Electrophysiology at the University of Utah, Salt Lake City. Uh, Dr. Ranjan is joining us to discuss medications for SVT patients. Thank you, Dr. Ranjan. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Ravi Ranjan. I'm a clinical electrophysiologist at University of Utah. Um, and delighted to be here and talk about supraventricular tachycardia and its um, management using medications. I'll go through a few cases and uh, hopefully that will help illustrate the role of medications uh, in patients who have supraventricular tachycardia. So let's start with case one. This is uh, a 90 year old female with palpitations. I saw her in clinic. Um, and she even had a presentation at a local healthcare facility where she had um, ECG recorded uh, during supraventricular tachycardia. Her heart rate during the arrhythmia was 155 beats a minute. Um, she was mildly symptomatic when she had this episode, and these episodes occur about once a month. So the question is how best we treat this patient keep this case in mind. How about, uh, so the second case is a 25 year old female with palpitations. She is 24 weeks pregnant and ECG shows SVT at a rate of 180 beats per minute. She's quite symptomatic when she has these episodes um, and she's having these episodes quite frequently. Uh, and as uh, this has sort of become a bigger problem for her during pregnancy, she didn't really have much of this um, before the pregnancy, but now it's happening quite frequently um, and was referred to uh, see me in the EP clinic as to how best to manage her going forward. And case number three is a 32-year-old male with palpitations. He uh, also had an ECG that documented his SVT at a rate of 175 beats a minute. Again, a very um, symptomatic patient. His episodes are about once a month. He's quite active, doing intense activity like remote hiking and skiing. Uh, and again, he came to my clinic to uh, figure out the next steps. So given my task of talking about medications, let's sort of discuss what we do acutely um, in patients who present uh, with SVT. And one of the things that works is uh, vagal maneuvers. So you can take a deep breath, hold it, um, and try and block some activity through the OV, AV node, and that usually helps in terminating this. Uh, some people do carotid massages. You might have heard stories of parents holding their kid upside down when sort of these things happen, um, or sort of splashing cold water on your face. All of this sort of increases parasympathetic input to the node. And all that we need is some transient disruption of the circuit in the AV node to terminate these episodes. Now, this works quite well in some patients, but clearly not in everybody. And a lot of people obviously don't know that they have SVT when they start having these palpitations. So end up getting um, acute attention in urgent care in an emergency room or through EMS. And adenosine is another agent that actually works quite well in uh, disrupting the arrhythmia circuit and stopping the SVT. Once again, adenosine is a medication that has a very short um, half-life. It transiently blocks activity in the AV node in the heart, uh, which is sort of an essential part of this SVT circuit that gets set up, um, causing heart uh, to beat really fast. So by giving adenosine, you sort of transiently disrupt the circuit and that stops the arrhythmia. Adenosine does give this uh, flushed feeling to patients uh, when this medicine is given, but as I said, the half-life of this is really short. It lasts less than a minute. It's a few seconds, actually, um, and then patients uh, mostly are fine. So that's another way of acutely terminating it. The other thing that takes a little bit longer to, um, to work on is giving 
uh, intravenous calcium channel blockers like diltiazem or beta blockers like metoprolol. Once again, the idea there is to sort of transiently disrupt what is happening um, in the AV node, which as I said earlier, is a very uh, integral part of SVT circuit. Uh, and any disruption of that uh, helps in stopping the arrhythmia. So the acute management focuses on um, transiently perturbing the activity through the AV node in the heart and sort of terminating the SVT. This is obviously not a permanent fixture um, of controlling the supraventricular tachycardia. So what about chronic management? Um, and as I said, the focus here is to talk about medication, so I'll restrict myself to that. So giving agents that slow conduction down the AV node, like beta blockers, uh, is a good agent for chronic management. Again, this is not foolproof, uh, and people can very much have breakthrough episodes despite taking beta blockers. But if um, it works in suppressing the number of episodes, the severity, meaning the duration for which these episodes last, that can be a big relief to a lot of patients. So that clearly is something that uh, can be considered. Other agents like calcium channel blockers that affect AV node, like the dil like diltiazem or verapamil are also agents that work. Now the calcium channel blockers tend to have more interaction with other medications, especially verapamil. So one has to be careful of other medication that patients are taking when we take that route, but um, definitely an attractive option um, for patients who are looking for um, medically managing this condition. More uh, advanced set of medications uh, like antirhythmic medications uh, like flecainide is also an option in certain cases. Um, it's a class 1C agent, um, so it's not something that you would have a primary care prescribe uh, or in general, um, even regular cardiologists prescribe, typically managed more so by uh, an electrophysiologist, but it is an option. It's a good option for certain patients. And then I, for deliberate reasons, I've sort of left some space between flecainide and the other antirhythmics like sotalol or amiodarone. Um, just because we don't use them so commonly. Uh, they are an option and can be in certain cases, uh, but that uh, would be sort of worthwhile discussing with your electrophysiologist to figure out uh, the best option if one is looking for medical management uh, of these diseases. So with those set of medication as option for SVT, uh, let's go back to our cases. So case one was this 90-year-old patient who was having some SVT episode with some mild symptoms. Um, so metoprolol would be a good option for her. And um, that's what I did for this patient. And once you have um, the patient on uh, a, a low dose, the medication, depending on how well it's tolerated and how effective it is, but an increase the dose as necessary um, to further reduce the frequency of these episodes and the severity. Um, obviously, patients who are taking this should be follow-up for SVT frequency and symptoms and medication sort of up titrated um, as necessary. And that worked well for this patient. We were not looking for an invasive approach um, for her as her episodes were rather infrequent and symptoms relatively mild. Uh, and she actually uh, did well with just metoprolol. Case number two uh, of the 25 year old pregnant female, uh, for her, uh, flecainide was a good option um, while she was pregnant. And the goal was to suppress her episodes enough during the um, pregnancy so that she could um, carry on with her pregnancy. And given her young age, we had extensive discussion about what to do after the pregnancy was, uh, was over. And we thought ablation was a good strategy. I mean, uh, she had enough of symptoms 
and had become quite uh, a problem during pregnancy. So we thought it was best for her to have it taken care of after the pregnancy was over. Uh, and sort of doing a more definitive treatment with ablation was a good option for her. Uh, and she responded well to flaconide. Flaconide is um, uh, reasonably well accepted to be given during pregnancy. Obviously, that's an issue that comes up in terms of how safe it is. Um, and there is data uh, to use flaconide during pregnancy, and that works quite well. Going on to the third case of this uh, very active male having these episodes, it was tough to suggest long-term medication for someone so active who also tended to go to remote places while um, he was um, doing his uh, skiing or biking. Um, and after extensive discussion, we thought ablation was a good strategy for him. Um, my mandate is not to talk about an ablation. I'm sure you're gonna hear at length about that as an option, uh, but um, one has to have a great, a good discussion with patients about all the options. And uh, hopefully with my three cases, I illustrated to you um, that medication does play a significant role or can play a significant role for a certain group of patients in managing SVT. And there are good medication options. Um, they work well, they're not perfect by any means. Um, and we obviously have to balance the issue of taking routine daily medication um, versus doing a procedure that is quite effective in taking care of, uh, of ablation. But in certain group of patients, uh, it obviously is an option that should be considered. Uh, let me end there and um, we'll take questions. Thank you so much. Really, really interesting. And um, some of the SVT patients that are joining this Living with SVT series have submitted some questions. So if I may ask the first question, although my SVT symptoms very rarely happen, I take an anticoagulant twice daily and need to do so for life. So I'm concerned about taking this drug and the effects of this medicine on my body with SVT. Should I be concerned? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, most of the medication that we talked about do not have much of an interaction with anticoagulation like beta blockers. So it'd be fine for you to take it, but obviously depending on what other medication you are taking would be worthwhile to discuss with your physician about interactions. But in general, um, the medications that I talk about, they work quite well. There are also medications that we have uh, patients on atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, and most of those are on blood thinners. So this is not something uh, that's so new or unknown to physicians who are taking care of patients with these arrhythmias. But in general, not an issue, but something you should discuss with your physician, again, depending on what other medications you're taking. Thank you. The next question, um, can I take medication only when I'm experiencing an SVT episode? And at what point or how high uh, is too dangerous or damaging to my heart if I choose not to take medication and try to ride out the SVT episode? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, and not something that we face that uncommonly, actually, because SVT are seen in patients who are otherwise perfectly healthy, have a normal heart, and they have these episodes very rarely, and people don't want to take medications all the time. So it's not actually uh, an uncommon scenario at all. And it's perfectly fine to do that, uh, take the medication recommended by your physician on an as-needed basis. Um, SVT in general are not dangerous or life-threatening. So the vast majority of patients do fine with SVT. Obviously, when your heart is racing at high rates of 170, 180 beats a minute, you feel it and it's not a great feeling, but uh, it's not dangerous or life-threatening um, the vast majority of time. So I don't think that should be a factor in you sort of worrying about whether I need to take the medication all the time. The biggest reason would be your frequency of these episodes uh, and how much it bothers you. Uh, and if it's tolerable and if it's very infrequent, you can even write it out, try the vagal maneuvers that I talked about. That works quite well for a lot of patients. 
And if those are not effective, then you could have a, a medication like a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker that you can take and that will help suppress this. Obviously, remember, when you take a medication orally, it takes a little bit of time for it to get into your system. It won't be an instantaneous five minute cure. Um, but if you're tolerating the SVT and it's not bothering you that much, it's perfectly fine to follow that approach. And do any of these medications interfere with memory loss or any other cognitive thinking? Not in general. Um, the medications that I discussed, uh, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, are very commonly prescribed in lots of patients and they take it without uh, much of a symptom. It can be a little bit of an issue in younger patients who are very active and doing sort of physically uh, strenuous exercise because beta blocker by nature limits the heart rate. And if you're pushing yourself um, aggressively to really high heart rates, you might feel like you hit a wall before you get to those um, high points of your activity. But in general, no association with cognitive issues uh, in terms of memory. Thank you. And Sam, I think you've had a few questions come in as well, haven't you? Yes, we had some questions about whether or not medications were safe during pregnancy, which you answered. I guess my question for that is if someone doesn't want to take medication while pregnant, are the bagel maneuvers safe to do? Yeah, while pregnant? Um, they are uh, reasonably safe. Obviously, talk to your physician before you embark on that approach. Um, but quite safe to do. They are transient, of course. Um, and if it disrupts your SVT, it's fine. Um, but obviously, you should have discussed this sort of with your physician before you embark on that as a sole strategy. Again, a lot of that discussion would be on how frequently you have this and what is the severity of your symptoms. If it's once a month lasting brief period of time and your heart rate is not that high, you could ride it out for a little bit and try these maneuvers and that would work. But if you're having these episodes every week and lasting long periods of time, you might need more than just vagal maneuvers. Um, yes, and fully understand the hesitancy of taking these medications during pregnancy um, and reasons to be cautious about it. I mean, that's obviously um, something that we all sort of espouse and sort of try to, um, try to achieve. But you should feel reassured that some of these medications are quite safe. I mean, obviously nothing's perfectly safe, but given the risks of SVT and rapid heart rates for extended period of time, um, these things are very well tolerated and people do fine on them. Great. Um, we've had several questions about hormones and thyroid interaction with, with SVT. So. Um, the one question we got this week was Hashimoto's and SVT sort of have this similar symptoms. How do you know which one is bringing on your symptoms if you have both? Yeah, so I mean, with thyroid issues, depending on what kind of problem you have, you could have high heart rates. And uh, not all high rate episodes uh, are SVT episodes. So again, this would obviously need a little bit more evaluation to figure out what is the arrhythmia that you're having. Is it just what we call sinus tachycardia? Like when you exercise, your heart rate goes up and that's obviously a natural response um, to the demands. It's not necessarily um, an abnormal rhythm. So if you have underlying thyroid issues um, and you're having rapid rates, obviously that needs a little bit more evaluation to figure out if you have SVT or just sinus tachycardia. If it is hyperthyroid that is sort of causing SVT, obviously the thyroid issues need to be dealt with and maybe that's all that you need to have your SVT taken care of. But if it persists beyond that, um, then you should obviously sort of think more about how do you take care of the SVT. I would say this, that the fact that you're having SVT, even if you have thyroid issues, essentially tells us that you have the substrate to have this problem. Um, so it definitely warrants a little bit more discussion of why you're having it and how you would take care of this long term. If you have both, um, what is the best medicine that you can 
take to avoid the palpitations? Yeah, I mean, beta blockers would be a good place to start. Um, they can help sort of um, dull the high heart rate that you get from being hypothyroid. Um, but obviously those are sort of temporary things that you do while you're getting your hypothyroid taken care of. Uh, obviously I don't want to sort of comment on those medications uh, and you would sort of talk to your endocrinologist and figure out what works the best. But yes, you can clearly take some of these medications to at least counter the effect of um, hyperthyroidism as you get that taken care of. Those are all my questions for today. Thank you, Dr. Ranjan, um, at such a clear, concise presentation and for answering these questions. I'm sure there will be more as people watch your presentation and we will be coming back to you. But I think it's really uh, given an insight into medication and treatment of SVT during our Living with SVT series. Thank you so much. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you. Take care. Welcome to Dr. Christopher Grow, Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Utah. Thank you for joining us, Chris, uh, joining our Living with SVT series. And I know you're going to explain everything about uh, one of the treatments for supraventricular tachycardia, ablation for SVT patients. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm Chris Grow, uh, an electrophysiologist at the University of Utah. And let's talk a little bit about um, ablation for uh, supraventricular tachycardia or SVT. And so to do that, I think we first need to talk about what is an electrophysiology study and what is an ablation procedure. So we'll talk about that briefly. Um, what are the indications for doing an electrophysiology study? Um, what to expect leading into the electrophysiology study and ablation procedure? What to expect actually during the procedure? Um, techniques and strategies in diagnosing and ablating SVT during an electrophysiology study. Uh, to be completely truthful, we need to talk about possible complications from an electrophysiology study as well, and then what to expect post-procedure. So an electrophysiology study, uh, basically what we're doing is we're bringing catheters, which are fancy plastic tubes that you can see in the bottom left part of the screen here, which, ha which have little electrodes on them to measure electrical signals at various spots in the heart. Um, these catheters can also pace the heart in addition to recording electrical signals. Um, and then some of our catheters can actually be integrated into three-dimensional mapping systems to allow us to create a 3D image um, of a heart as you see here in the bottom right. Um, this helps with also catheter position and measuring different electrical and tissue properties of the heart muscle itself. Um, some of the catheters like this one that's actually making this curve here um, can deliver ablation therapy with various different um, uh, energy sources to treat cardiac arrhythmias by creating a small focus of scar tissue with the goal of eliminating the source of the arrhythmia. So when do we do an electrophysiology study? Well, it's usually for someone that has documented SVT or supraventricular tachycardia, whether that's on an EKG, a remote monitor, an Apple watch or other smartwatch, or even a home monitoring device like the Cardia device. Um, anyone who also has a high suspicion for uh, SVT where we haven't been able to actually document it. We also do EP studies or electrophysiology studies, that's EP study for short, um, for unexplained syncope. And we can do the same thing just like we do for SVT, which are arrhythmias from the top chambers of the heart. We can do it for the bottom chambers of the heart as well, which are called ventricular arrhythmias or ventricular tachycardia. Um, and we do this to basically characterize or diagnose an arrhythmia with the intent of performing an ablation. Um, that's the common indication for SVT ablation. Um, we can test the conduction system to determine the need for a possible permanent pacemaker in some instances. And in um, other instances, we're actually evaluating the effectiveness of our medical therapy for fast heart rhythms or for risk stratifying um, a patient uh, with the um, with their risk for a life-threatening arrhythmia depending on their underlying heart conditions. So in preparation for the procedure itself, uh, in addition to the EKG or, or that Apple watch tracing or whatever other remote monitoring that might show the SVT, we sometimes get an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart. Um, this isn't always the case, but we, we do it in some instances. 
And for more complex procedures, sometimes we obtain an MRI scan of the heart. Um, again, this imaging isn't always performed and isn't necessarily critical for the procedure. Um, you won't have anything to eat the morning of the procedure because uh, you will likely get a little bit of anesthesia. Um, and so you can't eat anything usually after midnight leading up into the procedure. Uh, the physician will talk to you about what medications to continue and to hold. We usually hold most of your antiarrhythmic or SVT kind of suppressive therapy, um, usually for a couple days beforehand, because we wanna try to bring out the fast heart rhythm in the EP study itself because that's the only way we're able to really figure out what exactly it is and then successfully treat it. Uh, in the holding room area, which is like an example here on the right, where we have um, patients would be, uh, be waiting here, there would be curtains and walls <laughs> separating these beds here, but this is just an example of a holding room, but you'll meet the um, physician performing the procedure. Um, if you're at an academic institution, you might meet some of the fellows in the procedure. You'll meet the anesthesiology staff, and then you'll meet the nursing and support staff for either this holding room or prep and recovery area, or actually in the EP lab itself. Um, and then you get brought into the electrophysiology lab, which here is um, our electrophysiology lab at the University of Utah, where you have the x-ray camera, which is this big C-shaped structure here, the anesthesia card for the anesthesiologist. This is where the patient um, lies here with their head um, on this pillow. We have a big TV monitor here where we can see our x-ray images and our mapping system and all the different electrical signals. Um, all in all, you'll have about 10 to 50, uh, probably about five to 10 different people um, within the, um, the lab here helping out with the case. The physician is usually standing right alongside the bed here. Every once in a while, the physician has to go out um, over to our electrical um, kind of thinking area where we um, actually do pacing of the heart and different maneuvers. And we're looking at the electrical signals on a big computer screen. Um, so uh, it is not uncommon for the physician to actually leave um, the patient and just walk over to another area, which is not shown in this picture here. Um, that doesn't mean that you're being ignored. It means that we're actually doing a lot of the diagnostic testing to figure out what we need to go after um, for a possible ablation. Uh, once we uh, get started with the procedure, everything is done what we say percutaneously or kind of a minimally invasive approach where we thread um, uh, catheters, which are these plastic tubes, up through the blood vessels, usually in the leg, but sometimes in the neck or the arm. For SVT, we're usually trying to go through the veins. Um, and so we use ultrasound. Um, as you can see here, this is an ultrasound picture and we're targeting kind of this big blue oval, which is the vein, and we thread this catheter into the vein or into whatever blood vessel necessary. You can have up to um, four or five of these different catheters inserted into a blood vessel. And this is the way that we're able to bring um, our uh, electrophysiology catheters up into the heart to measure all of those electrical signals. So here's the physician standing um, at the bedside kind of looking at the, the screen. Um, and then we get our catheters placed at various places in the heart. Um, this is an X-ray image of these catheters uh, where you can see they're all in different places of the heart to measure the electrical signals at different places in the heart. And the point of this is that this is a EKG of SVT right here. Um, we have a good sense as electrophysiologists of what this arrhythmia might be when we look at it. Um, if you remember from other lectures in this series, there's usually kind of three common types of SVT. One is you can have an uh, extra light switch in the top chambers of the heart called atrial tachycardia. One is you could have a short circuit in the normal wiring system of the heart called AV node reentrant tachycardia. And one is you can have an extra connection between the top uh, and bottom chambers of the heart called an accessory pathway um, leading to another type of tachycardia. Those are the three main causes. And so when we see the EKG, we get a sense of which of the three it is, but we don't know for certain which one it is until we actually do the EP study. And so once we get our catheters all in place in the heart, we then try to get SVT going. So here's an example of the electrical signals at various places in the heart during supraventricular tachycardia. So the top couple um, lines here represent an EKG and then all of these other sharp signals are the local electrical signals at the different places. And from this, we do a variety of different pacing techniques and timing measurements to try to figure out which of the three major types of SVT you might be suffering from. And that allows us to then go ahead with the ablation part of the procedure. So let's look at the three major types of SVT and how we do the ablation for them. 
So this is AV node reentrant tachycardia, which is a short circuit within the normal wiring system of the heart. So the normal wiring system of the heart, it starts in the top right chamber um, with the heart's own pacemaker called the sinus node. That's kind of up over here and it filters down into this yellow wire, um, which is overlaid by this blue arrows here and the green arrows here. And this yellow wire uh, brings the electrical signals from the top chambers to the bottom chambers. What can happen in a certain uh, percentage of the population is people get an extra connection in this kind of normal wiring system here um, uh, down below the yellow part. And they have uh, basically this circular circuit, as you see in the right panel, which goes around in a circle, causing this AV node reentrant tachycardia. So the goal for ablation here, <coughs> excuse me, is to ablate this extra connection right here. And this is an example of our mapping system where you can see the catheters have created a shell of part of the heart. You can see one of our catheters going off on the screen. This is looking at the heart in two different views. And these are our ablation lesions right here in the red, um, targeting this extra connection right here. The yellow is again, the normal wiring system of the heart. So we try to stay obviously far away from that because we don't wanna cause a need for a pacemaker. So we make sure we outline where the normal wiring system is and then do this ablation to target this extra connection. For this accessory pathway um, SVT, which is called orthodromic reciprocating tachycardia, um, when it goes in a backwards direction, if it goes in a forwards direction, um, this uh, extra connection here, um, like I said, everything starts in the top right chamber, it filters down into the bottom chambers through what's called the AV node. But if you have this extra connection and it goes forward, it causes what we uh, what is called uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And you can get fast heart rhythms that go around in a circle. Um, like this, or if this connection doesn't go forward and only goes backward, it can go the other way. It can go around like this, um, causing this orthodromic reciprocating tachycardia is the fancy term. So ablation of this, we have to go and find where this accessory pathway is. Um, here's an example here on the right, again, looking at our mapping system where we've created a shell of the heart uh, using these catheters. And then you see these red dots over here and over here. Um, where uh, we actually had to go over across into the top left chamber of the heart and ablate this accessory pathway over there to get rid of the SVT um, that was going through this extra pathway. Um, and finally, this uh, atrial tachycardia or the extra light switch um, as represented in the top uh, right heart here where you have kind of this focus here that seems to be firing um, incessantly at certain times causing SVT. So to ablate that, we have to go figure out where that extra light switch is. So here's an example where red is the earliest signal of activation where that light switch is firing in the top left chamber of the heart, actually just right over here. And we go over and we cross from the right side to the left side to actually ablate um, that little focus over there. And so the last two examples I showed, both this one and this one, we had to get over to the left side of the heart all of our catheters normally come up to the right side of the heart. <coughs> so to do that, we actually do what's called a transeptal puncture. We don't do this for all SVT ablation uh, cases, only if we need to go over to the left side. Um, it sounds a little scary to make a puncture hole inside the heart, but we actually do this very routinely now, especially for atrial fibrillation ablation. Um, and so we're, we're very well versed and um, we can do this very safely. Um, we use uh, x-ray, uh, we use ultrasound, and here you can see this wire um, from this sheath here, which is this plastic tube extending into the left atrium. It's a very curly wire, um, so it's nice and safe. It doesn't poke any holes in anything except um, in this uh, thin part of what's called the septum, which separates the top two chambers of the heart. You can see it here um, on ultrasound as well. You'll see this wire um, kind of extending at the top left chamber. And then here you have an example of some of our catheters over on the left side. So we take a variety of techniques to do this and make this very safe. It does increase the bleeding risk. It does increase the stroke risk of the procedure very, very slightly. Um, but overall, it is still done very, very safely. And with that, I think that brings us into uh, the full disclosure part of the talk, which is talking about complications of SVT ablation. Overall, the risk of any complication from an SVT ablation is probably less than 1%, um, especially for any major complications. Uh, most of the 
<coughs> most of the data we have for complications from ablation type procedures comes from atrial fibrillation ablation because that's the most common procedure that we do. Um, and so this is a list of, uh, of possible complications. You can have bleeding complications. Um, you can poke a hole in the heart causing blood to accumulate around the heart. You can cause damage at the groin puncture sites where we're inserting our catheters. Um, there is a small risk of stroke as well, especially if we were over on the left side. There is a risk of needing a pacemaker if we're ablating um, very close to the normal wiring system, we cause damage to the normal wiring system. But again, these complication rates, which you see for the most part, um, are all less than one to 2%. As I mentioned, these are for atrial fibrillation ablation. These patients um, for AFib ablation tend to be older. Um, they tend to also all be on blood thinners, so that increases the bleeding risk. And it's also a, a much more lengthy and um, I would say complex procedure. So I think this is still an overestimate of what are the risk of complications from ablation procedures. And there's been several studies that have looked at what is the success rate and the complication rate of ablation for SVT. And you see for something like AVNRT, that short circuit in the normal wiring system, it's about 96 to 97%. For that extra pathway, it's about 93%. And for those extra light switches, it's a little bit more variable, anywhere from 80 to 100%. And if you look at the complication rate, it's still predicting an overall complication rate of less than 3%, 3% or less for any of the uh, three procedures. But for major, major complications, it's far less than 1%. And again, this is now data that is over um, about over 12 years old or so. And I think the, we even made mark advancements in um, the safety of, of our technique in the last 10 to 15 years in ablation procedure. So I wouldn't even, I wouldn't be surprised if this complication rate is actually much lower than what's even reported here. So with that, you can see it's very successful, usually over 90% success for a, an SVT ablation with um, a very low complication rate. And because of that, if you look at the guidelines for um, electrophysiologists uh, like myself and for patients, under, uh, who suffer from SVT, um, if they have SVT, if you just look in, the, in this, um, in this uh, pathway here, you can see that if they are a candidate for ablation, if the patient wants to be um, ablated, we actually recommend ablation um, kind of as our first line therapy. Um, that has a class one recommendation, which is our highest recommendation for undergoing um, ablation for SVT. It's either medications or ablation. They both have class one indications. I think that just speaks to um, both the efficacy and the safety um, of the procedure. And really the ablation is looked at as a curative, uh, curative procedure, unlike the medications, for lack of a better term, are more or less just a band-aid for the SVT and they're not gonna get rid of it completely. They're just gonna help you control your symptoms. The goal for the ablation is to get rid of it permanently. And so with that, um, I thank you uh, for your time and um, feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you, Dr. Groh, that, that was so informative. Just a, a couple of questions that we've had submitted. Um, obviously the success rate far outweighs the complications, but when you're a patient, you are still going to be worried about any complications. So what, what risks are there if you decide to do nothing when you have SVT, when your doctor is recommending an ablation? So if you don't, if you don't go ahead um, with the procedure at all uh, in terms of risks from SVT itself, so we don't usually uh, think of SVT as a life-threatening arrhythmia. Um, there's very, very uh, specific situations where it can be um, life-threatening and that's mostly for patients who suffer from Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Um, but otherwise, most other SVT is really a huge annoyance and a, just really bothersome for a lot of people. It, and it really interferes with your quality of life, um, but it isn't necessarily life-threatening. That being said, I don't want to minimize you know, the, the symptoms or, or, or what people feel from their SVT, because if it requires you to go to the emergency room for um, various medications like IV adenosine, um, which I'm sure some people have experienced before. And especially if you're traveling um, or something like that, I think it can cause a lot of unnecessary kind of anxiety knowing that you have SVT and that there's a risk you could go into SVT um, if, you, if you don't have it treated. And 
Yes, I think, you know, if, if patients are very adverse to procedures, then we try our best to treat with medications. But as you can see, as I mentioned, the success rate for the ablation is, is very high. And because of that, and with its low complication rate, it does receive, that's where it does receive that high recommendation from, from the Heart Rhythm Society, so. And if I was a, an older patient, 70, 75 year old, is it more prudent to stay on beta blockers or to have a, an ablation? Um, again, you know, looking from an individualized approach, I still think it's, I still think it's very reasonable to go ahead with ablation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we do atrial fibrillation ablation, like I mentioned, it tends to be an older population. So, and that's a more complex procedure. So it's not uncommon that we will do atrial fibrillation ablation in 70 year olds. Um, so I don't think that, you know, for most 70, 75 year olds, still the procedure risk um, is still very low and we take a lot of great techniques to make it as safe as possible. So I don't think, you know, that should be um, precluding uh, someone um, from an ablation procedure. I mean, we will even do um, SVT ablation patients on patients who are even far older than 70 or 75, so. Thank you. Sam, I think you have some questions. I do. What? So with pediatric patients, are you able to do an ablation on children? Um, yes, we do ablations on children. Um, I personally don't, I'm an adult electrophysiologist, but there are pediatric electrophysiologists as well, um, where they do ablations um, on children, um, usually you know, far under the age of 18, sometimes under the age of 10. Um, and uh, a lot of that, the most common type of arrhythmias that they see is that Wolf-Parkinson-White um, syndrome, that extra connection that people are just born with in between the top and the bottom chambers of the heart. Um, and because there is that um, slight risk of, of it being life-threatening due to dangerous heart rhythms, that is a more common um, arrhythmia that they see um, in the pediatric uh, uh, arena. Than, but we still see it in the adult world as well, but they see that more commonly in the pediatric world. Is that something more, they're more likely to, to treat with ablation as a child? Yeah, again, um, uh, because it, if, even if you look at Wolf Parkinson White um, specifically um, at, at, as an arrhythmia and an, and an SVT cause, um, again, we're really uh, strong proponents of ablation, especially in those patient populations, um, because there is that risk of, of a sudden death or a dangerous heart rhythm associated with Wolf Parkinson White. Um, and that's just because of the ex that extra connection doesn't have some of the normal filtering properties that the heart's normal wiring system does. So it predisposes them to a risk of dangerous heart rhythms from the bottom chambers, which could be life-threatening. So that's where even pediatric electrophysiologists will still, um, you know, kind of promote um, ablation um, definitely in that, in that younger population. And for the other types of SVT that aren't Wolf Parkinson White in the pediatric population, again, I think it comes down to how symptomatic um, the patient is. In very, very, very rare instances, um, constant SVT, like where it's happening almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that can cause the heart muscle to get weak over time. Um, that's a very, that's a rare instance that that usually does not happen. Um, but in situations like that. And if medications don't seem to be working, then you know an ablation is definitely very appropriate in that patient too. And so that would be another reason I would think of that a pediatric electrophysiologist would be a strong proponent of ablation if medications weren't working. That makes sense. Um, are there any other health conditions that might complicate having a successful ablation? Um, yes, I think, you know, because it's still a procedure on your heart, um, you know, the weaker that your heart muscle might be, um, that would predispose you to it, uh, you know, more complications um, for a, a riskier procedure, just because you have less, what we would call cardiac reserve. Um, so that your ability to tolerate even a very small risk of a, a complication, if that small risk did happen, the complication could be a little bit more serious just because you don't have a lot of what we would say cardiac reserve or something like that. Um, so patients that have um, bad heart failure, the risk does go up. Is it prohibitive? That's more kind of on a patient to patient basis that we make that decision. Um, there's other 
uh, kind of anatomical uh, conditions and other congenital heart disease that patients might have been born with that would increase the risk of the procedure um, as well, partially from an anatomic perspective. So in those types of situations, I would, you know, if you are a patient that suffers from congenital heart disease, um, I would uh, make sure that you're going to a center that has experience in ablation for congenital heart disease patients um, uh, because the complexity can be a little bit higher. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and then, you know, other just non-cardiac but overall health conditions, if you have um, uncontrolled diabetes, for example, then you're not as healthy as someone who has very controlled um, diabetes. And so um, again, risks of any type of procedure are going to go up slightly. And whether that's from the procedure that we're doing from a, a, um, a heart standpoint, or even the anesthesia that you're receiving um, during the case, for example. So, you know, patients that have untreated bad sleep apnea and are morbidly obese have a higher risk of anesthesia complications than someone that doesn't suffer from those conditions. So all in all, it's a, it, we kind of do it on a case-by-case -case approach and that's you know why, especially for um, sicker patients or patients that have many other medical conditions, we um, utilize the assistance of anesthesiologists in addition to ourselves. So you have a whole team of um, kind of doctors make, trying to make the procedure as safe as possible for you. And just on some you know everyday routine things. So is it a day case? Does the patient have to stay how many nights in hospital? What is the routine? Right, right. So um, usually most SVT cases are a same day case. Um, you actually, when you finish, when we finish the case, you have to lie flat for a couple hours after the procedure. And that's to let the groin puncture sites where we inserted our catheters heal. Um, we also monitor your vital signs and things like that during that period. We're looking for any bleeding um, issues or any issues with the heart itself. Um, that usually requires anywhere from two to six hours of, of kind of lying flat after the procedure. Um, and then we get you up walking around, make sure that everything is, is going well and that you're feeling okay. Um, and then you usually go home um, afterwards. And you know the, the, the doctor will give you instructions about what medications to take or what medications not to take. Sometimes you might be on a, a, a blood thinner if you weren't on one already. Um, just for a short period after the ablation. We do that sometimes for when we go over um, and we made that transeptal puncture to get from the right side to the left side. So we sometimes put those patients on a short course of a blood thinner for um, a couple weeks afterwards just to minimize their stroke risk. But all for the most part, I would say over 90% of SVT ablation patients go home the same day. So you, you mentioned a blood thinner, an anticoagulant. Um, and that's to prevent any little clot forming in the heart and breaking off, which could travel to the brain to trigger a stroke. So you, you make sure you minimize that risk. Right. Um, and the catheter goes up through the groin, so it's not open heart surgery. No, not open heart you, surgery. You normally go home the same day, but when can you start driving and go back to work again? Right. So um, every institution might have slightly different guidelines on, on, on certain physical uh, activities from um, my perspective. So you can't drive uh, the same day because you can't drive home from your procedure um, because most likely you got anesthesia and that's just not safe after receiving anesthesia medications um, for you to drive afterwards. But um, in my, from my opinion, you could drive the next day. Um, we tell uh, our patients kind of one week of taking it easy and letting the groin puncture sites heal. So taking it easy means you can walk around the house, you can climb stairs, you can do most of your normal daily activities. You probably shouldn't go you know, run a marathon though, do any heavy lifting around the house, move a bunch of furniture, anything like that, where you're basically putting a lot of strain in the groin area. You shouldn't do that for one week after the procedure. Um, and most patients you know, kind of feel back to their self, um, usually within a day. Um, you might feel a little bit more tired and run down in that first day, and that's mostly because of the anesthesia um, that you received causing you to feel a little bit tired. But otherwise, you know, it's usually about a, a 24 hour recovery or so. And you know, again, depending on people's jobs and what amount of physical activity they do, if you have a desk job, you can probably go back to work within one to two days. If you're a construction worker and having to do a more heavy lifting, then again, you're gonna be off work probably for a week. 
Um, so it really is, it's kind of a case by case approach, but that's kind of the general um, recommendations that we give, so. So they won't be skiing down the slopes that we can see behind you for a, a few few weeks. No, now. not 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 for a not for a week probably. So, <laughs> Dr. Chris Grow, thank you so much for your time for walking us through the procedure and answering the questions that um, people with SVT have submitted. We really appreciate it. We know how busy you are, and thank you for helping us with this living with SVT series. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me again. We're now going to um, share uh, Dr. Steinberg's screen so that um, I know Dr. Steinberg is uh, going to present on smartwatch and other mobile monitoring for SVT management. Over to you, Dr. Steinberg. Thank you. Thank you, um, Trudy and the uh, Arrhythmia Alliance team. It's, again, really a pleasure to be here, and we appreciate the opportunity. Um, so for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, smartwatch and other mobile monitoring for SVT management. Um, you've heard, or you will hear from my colleagues about the different SVTs and manifestation, and I'll focus about some of the new opportunities for diagnosis and treatment, uh, especially here at the University of Utah. So why are we talking about home monitoring for SVT? Well, SVT is episodic and fickle. It can be unpredictable. And, and those of you that have had SVT, uh, this may ring very true. Episodes can be brief or they can be very long, but often patients don't know when they're gonna start and they often don't know when they're gonna end. And that makes it difficult to, to sometimes get a diagnosis and to understand what's going on. Um, for some patients, especially if they have an idea of what it is, uh, these episodes don't necessarily otherwise require emergency care. And so for some patients to seek emergency room care uh, merely for a diagnosis or to get a recording of it, uh, represents quite a, an inconvenience and, and obviously burdens the healthcare system, uh, particularly in these days of, of, um, of high resource utilization for emergency services. Um, but as many people know, and as we've talked about, SVT can be highly symptomatic and very bothersome and, and really interfere um, with daily living. And so getting a diagnosis um, by recording it uh, can be extremely helpful for a variety of reasons. Um, classic monitoring, monitoring that we do through our through the health system, usually historically is required medical devices, devices that can be cumbersome, uh, they can be expensive, if not to the patient, to the health system, but often to the patient as well. <clears throat> they can be very irritating. The number one complaint we get um, for much of our monitoring is the adhesive that is required to adhere to the, uh, to the patient's skin to monitor the heart rhythm. Uh, and they may miss episodes. It's pretty classic for me to prescribe a monitor for a patient to wear for three or five or seven days, and the patient will have no episodes or symptoms and return the monitor. And the day after the monitor, they'll have a major episode of symptoms that they wish we had recorded, uh, but the study of the monitor that was prescribed ended. Uh, and that can be extremely frustrating and occur over and over. And so this is why we're talking about home monitoring solutions or consumer monitoring. <clears throat> What do we mean by consumer devices? Well, there's a variety of devices on the, um, on the market. Um, many people are obviously familiar with the Apple Watch. There's a few different generations, some of which have this ECG function. There are other watch devices that record pulse. There are even other what we call biometric uh, devices or devices that record all kinds of um, vital signs and, and physiologic parameters. Uh, and then there are... Um, pretty much ECG devices or electrocardiogram devices that record the, the heart's electrical activity. And so um, I think one of the main points to take home today is that it, it, it really depends on the device and, and, and some devices are much better than others. Um, and one way to think about that uh, is this analogy I like to show. So many devices measure pulse um, on the wrist, um, basically perfusion through the artery or blood flow through the artery, uh, which obviously is important. Um, but when we're talking about the heart rhythm, what we really care about is the heart's electrical activity. And so um, there's pulse monitoring, which can be a reflection of the heart's electric activity, but is a surrogate or is derivative, is not necessarily directly reflective of the heart's electrical activity. And so it's a little bit like this comparison of a, of a rudimentary bed and breakfast versus at least the, the gold standard of hotels, at least here in Salt Lake City, is the, the Grand America. Um, and this actually, <clears throat> represents also the distinction between the Apple Watch Series 3 or before uh, and the Apple Watch Series 4 and later. In fact, the 4 and later 
um, integrated this ECG measurement, whereas the earlier versions did not. Other devices have these different features, but, but this is one example of the distinction where even within the same family of device, uh, there is different capability. Um, it's not to say this pulse or plethysmography monitoring is not useful, and we'll see an example of that. But when we're talking about the heart's rhythm and when I wanna make a diagnosis or to monitor what's really going, along, going on with the heart's electrical activity, ECG is, is ideal. Um, and this is another example. This is an older version of the Apple Watch that measures pulse, and it's saying the pulse is 40 at the time when an EKG was recorded in the office with a heart rate of 147. And, uh, and, and we can talk about the physiology of why this occurs, uh, but I think this nicely highlights some of the limitations of different technologies. Now, that's not to say pulse monitoring is not useless. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the Apple Heart Study, which was a very large study of patients wearing an Apple Watch, again, the earlier version, um, that was surveilling or monitoring for possible arrhythmias. Um, and if it alerted, an important feature of this study was that that finding was confirmed by a patch, a patch that actually measured heart's electrical activity in the form of EKG. Um, and that led to possible healthcare interactions. Um, but this was a nice demonstration of use of a pulse, but again, very important to highlight that it was confirmed using an electrical monitoring device, a, a patch monitoring device. And so again, patients would get a novocation, they would wear an ECG patch, and that was how they determined whether the patient really had an arrhythmia. But a large proportion of notifications did indicate arrhythmia. It wasn't perfect, but it demonstrated the potential for this technology for surveillance. And that, that was really the value of the Apple Heart Study. But again, that device didn't directly measure electrical activity. In contrast is this device, which is one of many, but was one of the early devices on the market, is the Alive Core, the Cardia um, device. And it measures heart's electrical activity. The, the, mo the more contemporary versions of these devices can measure multiple leads. And by leads, really what we're getting is different views of the heart. So instead of just, you know, looking straight on, you're looking for different angles, if you will, from electrical activity. And that can be very valuable for us. So this is six leads. It provides diagnostic quality, really, in my opinion, uh, and can be very valuable. It's using your smartphone and is easy to upload and share and has some, for those in the United States, has FDA um, labeling for some different indications. Um, and again, this isn't the only one, but this has been one of the more popular and earliest developed ones. And in full disclosure, I, I do some research with this company. Um, but this is the device. It, it basically requires contact with your skin at three different points, usually two fingers and or an ankle, um, and, and relays the, the recording to the device. And this can be used for a variety of arrhythmias, um, but for patients with SVT, um, it doesn't necessarily have FDA clearance, but I find it can be helpful for recording SVT. <clears throat> and this is what we're talking about. Why are we talking about this? Why is it so important to record the arrhythmia when patients are having it? Well, this is a study we did here at the University of Utah. And if you'll follow me, we looked at patients that were in our clinic and had an EKG recording documenting whether or not they were in a specific arrhythmia. This was talking about atrial fibrillation, but it's relevant to all arrhythmia. And we classified patients by whether or not they were in a rhythm at the time of the visit or whether they were not. And we also asked patients whether they thought they were in an arrhythmia. Without telling them what the EKG thought, we just said, do you think your heart's out of rhythm today or do you think it's in normal rhythm? And so these boxes demonstrate who fell into what category. And so in the top left were patients that were documented to be out of rhythm. Their heart was in an arrhythmia. It was not a normal rhythm. And of those 114, 72 said, yeah, my heart's out of rhythm. But 42 actually didn't know. They said, no, my heart's in normal rhythm, even though we have documentation saying it was out of rhythm. In contrast, there were 391 patients whose heart were not in an arrhythmia. They were in normal rhythm. Their EKG demonstrated they were not having an arrhythmia at the time of the visit. And of those 391, in the bottom right, 356 said, yeah, my heart's in normal rhythm. I'm not having a problem today. But 35 of those patients said, yeah, my heart's in an arrhythmia, even though we have documentation showing it wasn't. And so the take home here is that 
perception of arrhythmia, the feeling that we have of our heart racing or palpitations does not always reflect an electrical arrhythmia. It doesn't mean there's not something going on. It doesn't mean you're not feeling something. It doesn't mean that there's nothing to treat. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean any of those. It just means that those sensations don't correlate with an electrical abnormality at that time, necessarily. Um, and, and we believe this to be true also in other arrhythmias, but this was one example. Um, interestingly, we also record kind of symptom scores overall. In other words, how is your life with respect to arrhythmia symptoms? And it suggests, and if you look at these scores, about 12 in this row and about six to seven in this row, suggests that there is a lot that goes into the sensation and the burden of arrhythmia. And, and that patients that thought they were in arrhythmia, no matter whether, whether or not they were in an arrhythmia, seem to have a higher burden of overall symptoms during their life. And, and the take home here is that the reason to monitor and the reason to get diagnosis and to record different arrhythmias is to really understand the correlation between what are you feeling and what's going on with the heart's electrical activity so that we can tailor therapy to make you feel better because that's often the primary goal. There are other goals, but that's often the primary goal. And so how does home monitoring come into this? Well, we talked a little bit at the limitations of, of classic monitoring of medical devices and, and care and flow, but we didn't talk about what that means on the health system side and, and why that can be often so inconvenient to patients. Well, here's the traditional paradigm. We have a patient here, they have symptoms that suggest an arrhythmia. They call the doctor. The doctor says, okay, come in and get a recording or send you this device, come in and get an EKG. The patient drives to the office, they get the EKG. The EKG goes into the electronic health record, <clears throat> it's uploaded. The doctor reviews that and then goes back and says, this is what's going on. You're having arrhythmia, you're not having arrhythmia, this is what we should do. More often than not, to the great frustration of patients and clinicians, the EKG is normal by the time they get it done. And we don't know what was causing the symptoms because the patient feels better and the EKG is normal. So we don't know what was going on when the patient was feeling poorly or having symptoms. And so enter this new paradigm, which, which we at the University of Utah and other centers are, are implementing, which is that the patient has symptoms of arrhythmia or has has complaints, has something going on that may be related to arrhythmia. They do a smartphone or some sort of EKG recording on their own on, this, on one of these devices, and it can be uploaded directly into the electronic health record through a variety of mechanisms. As their physician, and again, this is, this is primarily related, you know, for patients who we see already and we kind of have an idea of their health history, we review that EKG and we, we see, oh, we see what's going on, Mr. Smith, this is what's going on. And in contrast, this is a much more streamlined, much more convenient workflow um, and process for both patients and the health system. And it offers, um, a, I think, a higher likelihood of diagnosis, uh, more expedited treatment and management, um, and can provide a much more convenient venue and mechanism for patients to have their symptoms evaluated, ideally to provide reassurance. Um, but at least to provide feedback and input about what's going on. And so this is really the holy grail and where we're moving at the University of Utah and, and elsewhere in terms of home-based monitoring and management of arrhythmia using these smart devices. <clears throat> so in summary, what are we talking about for home monitoring for SVT? Well, home monitoring and smartphone monitoring offers an emerging opportunity for improvement in diagnosis. For improvement in treatment, because we can target treatments to what we're seeing on the monitoring to that specific arrhythmia, often SVT, but not always. And then lastly, the monitoring. And, and often this takes the form of reassurance to patients who maybe seem like they're having recurrent symptoms of SVT, and, but it's not the same necessarily. And I've had a procedure, I've had an intervention, and is this SVT? Is this something else? What's going on? Often reassurance, but again, not always. Um, and as we talked about, Monitoring uh, and consumer devices are, are device dependent and not all consumer devices are created equally. Um, ideally, we use devices that record electrocardiogram or ECG. One telltale of that is that in order to record an ECG, um, usually two components of skin have to be in contact. So not just something on the watch, but say a watch and a finger contact to that watch 
or a device where you're holding it and both hands are touching it. Um, those indicate that it's likely recording ECG, but again, not all. Um, and then lastly, that healthcare system integration is often key, is that using these devices across email or cell phone, text messaging really is not ideal for management. It's not ideal for uh, information security and maintaining your privacy. Um, and it's not ideal for, for kind of health system integration and making sure that the, the data and the information gets to the team in a timely and efficient and, and safe manner to, to manage your health. Um, and, so, and so that's where we're, where we're moving. Um, that's why we're talking about this. This is what we hope is the future of management of arrhythmia and patients with SVT and others. Um, and and, uh, and it's, it's really not a, a great opportunity to talk to you about this today. And, and we're happy to, to take questions or, or to see you in clinic. So thank you everyone for your time and thank you to the Liberty Alliance uh, for, for the opportunity to, to present to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Steinberg, a superb presentation. And uh, just a few questions for you, really. The, again, the most common question we receive um, in, at our helpline is, how do I know which monitor to purchase? How do I know if it's FDA approved in the US or NICE approved in the UK or any other regulatory board? How can I find that out? I don't want to waste my money, but I do want to try to monitor my, my heart health. Yeah, this, this is a great question. And, and the, the explosion of devices is, is really posed a challenge for consumers. Certainly the device websites can give you details about FDA um, and how to use it. Um, to be honest, I, I think your physician is, is really the best resource for a few reasons. Number one, if you're gonna use these devices, it's, it's helpful to be under the care of a physician so that you have somebody that knows you and has a relationship with you that can interpret the findings from these devices. I think that's number one and, and by far the most important. But secondarily, your physician may have an infrastructure for certain types of devices or, or, or may have more experience with some devices than others. And so if your physician has an understanding of what the limitations are for specific devices and what the value is, that could be helpful uh, as well. Um, but in general, the goal and, and my recommendation to patients is, is devices that record ECG. So that's usually the Apple Watch 4 and above, uh, the Alive Core, some of which do have FDA and um, some of the European mark uh, clearances. Um, but ideally devices where you have to touch two, two um, usually two hands, but two po components of skin uh, really indicates that it's recorded in EKG. But, but I think your, your, your treating physician um, ideally is the, is the, is the best uh, resource um, to be engaged in, in your health. Um, to again, make sure you're, you're getting a, a device that may be helpful for your health and obviously not wasting money. Absolutely, and not giving um, potentially inaccurate results and causing extra worry and stress. Exactly. Um, how have you found these devices? I mean, really, this question is to both you and Dr. Bunch. Have these devices um, improved and uh, improved outcomes and really come into their own since we've had the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, lockdowns and restrictions and fewer medical appointments? Yeah, this is, this is a great question, and I'm certainly interested in Dr. Bunch's opinion. And my, my opinion has been, I think, two or three uh, facets. Number one is diagnosis and these very fickle arrhythmias that we, you know, we can't monitor somebody 24-7 for 10 years. But having a device when they have a symptom is extremely valuable and allows us to target therapies to an arrhythmia as opposed to kind of broadly, number one. Number two, monitoring and reassurance for patients. Um, as we talked about, arrhythmias can be very bothersome. Anytime you're talking about heart disease, obviously can cause extreme anxiety and stress because of the potential seriousness of it. And so these devices often offer a lot of reassurance or safety to patients that even if they don't do recordings can say, oh, I know that if I have a problem, I can record it and send it to my physician, whether they do or not. And then number three, and lastly, one of the things you touched on, and one of the things actually that's um, the source of a, a major national study we're doing here with Dr. Bunch and I and many other people at Utah and elsewhere is, is how to use these devices to monitor some of the therapies that you've heard about with, with COVID-19, but also other arrhythmia therapies um, that may impact EKG and, and, and more on that to come. But I think that has the huge um, opportunity to, to change care as well. But I, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bunch as well. So I, I think that summarized really good. Uh, 
re really well. I think there's two things with them uh, that are important. One is I, I recently reviewed uh, the results of a large research study, and they estimated that these new direct-to-consumer wearable devices that now uh, provide arrhythmia care uh, make it more broadly available to people um, have increased the the yield of diagnosis of abnormal heart rhythms by about 30 percent. Now that's good and bad. Um, it can be good because we're aware of things, but there's also we have to be careful that the treatments don't uh, that are appropriate and that it, when you get a diagnosis that you're treated in the right pathway with, and, and, and get the right information. I think the Rhythmia Alliance will be critical as a partner in that. Because just because they see something doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be treated. Uh, I think on the flip side though, one thing that's really important to understand when the Apple Watch came out in the really large trial, it did detect an abnormal rhythm called atrial fibrillation that we see with strokes. But it, and, and a lot of people thought, well, this has no side effects. It's just a watch you wear. But there were about 20% of people that reported more anxiety watching their rhythm all the time. So if you're a personality type that you're checking that watch all the time, every time you feel something, these, that can be not necessarily a help in your medical care, but it could be a hindrance. So make sure your personality is okay. Make sure you're not looking at that all the time sending numerous tracings in. Uh, it could be a valuable tool, but if it's the wrong personality types, it can, it can be harmful because as I mentioned in, in my talk, one of the greatest things to help your heart health is being active and decreasing stress and anxiety. And if the watch or the monitor is making that worse, it's hurting a little bit. So just be careful and know your personality type, align with a doctor uh, that you can trust and align with with good resources online, like the Rhythmia Alliance, where you can get good information and, and always seek a second opinion. If, if, if what you hear doesn't sit right for you, I think I know myself, I know Dr. Steinberg, we welcome patients getting a second opinion. Uh, we think that's part of the education you need to make the best decision. Totally agree with you, Dr. Bunch, well, and, and Dr. Steinberg on several of those points. Um, and part of this living with SVT and hearing from different doctors is so that the patients can access the views of differing doctors to hopefully improve their confidence with the doctor that they're seeing. You know, they can hear, oh, that doctor's saying the same as my doctor. And if not, why not? Um, certainly, we have found uh, the Apple Watch it has been superb, as has the uh, live call cardia. But with the Apple Watch, it tells you you're in sinus rhythm. And we've had so many calls. I'm in sinus rhythm. Should I go to the ER? Because for the layperson, sinus is when you get a cold in your sinuses. You know, a lot of people. So I think that also the manufacturers, the producers of, of these um, wonderful detection tools also have to ensure that they provide the education because the last thing we want to do is to cause anxiety and stress. And there's been so many, you know, really concerned saying they're in sinus rhythm rather than normal rhythm or the rhythm appears to be normal. Um, and I also think the devices are probably really helpful for the clinicians, especially when for example, in atrial fibrillation, if it's paroxysmal, where it comes and goes, the same with SVT. You can't, you know, you may, may be booked to have an EKG, but on that moment in time, you might not have an F SVT episode. Whereas if you're at home watching TV or whatever, and suddenly you can feel, it's, it's a great way to gather that evidence to help you and your physician. Do you agree? Absolutely. And I think that's some of the things we've highlighted is, is, you know, we don't often talk about convenience in healthcare, um, but convenience often can impact health and management, um, especially when it comes to these arrhythmias, as you highlight, um, Trudy, the number of, of patients, the frequency with which this happens is, is astounding in our field, um, which is this trying to correlate symptoms and what's happening at home um, with an arrhythmia or not. Um, and uh, and particularly here um, in Utah and Salt Lake, you know, we live in the Mountain West. Um, the geography is vast uh, and not all patients have access 
even to an ER um, or, or an EKG machine um, with an hour's drive. And so um, this is not even about convenience so much about is it maybe about access to healthcare for, for some of our patients. Um, and, and, and fortunately, you know, we're talking about SVT today, which is not life-threatening in, uh, in general, but um, for some patients recording their arrhythmia theoretically could be the, um, the difference between life and death and, and management and catching something that, um, that, that could have big implications. So, so I think there's enormous potential, but as, as you and Dr. Bunch have very nicely highlighted, um, we need to be cognizant of, of the potential adverse consequences. And um, as you just highlighted, communication, um, just like everything in life, it's so much about communication and, and the message that the watch or the device or the clinician gives to the patient about what that recording means and often most importantly, what it doesn't mean. <clears throat> I, I totally agree. I think that the devices are wonderful, used in the right way. Um, and like we shouldn't be jumping on the scales every two minutes to watch our weight, we shouldn't be recording our heart rhythm every two minutes. However, if we do experience flutters or palpitations or banging of the heart and it feels like it's going to explode out of our chest or, or dizziness or whatever, they are useful tools to help you and your clinician investigate further. Um, and, and so it's more of a, a detection rather than a diagnosis uh, tool. That's a great way to put it. Thank you both. And thank you for your colleagues as well for helping us deliver living with SVT. I know we've already have um, many, many uh, people registering for this series. And we thank you for your time, your expertise, and for taking time out today to present. And we hope it will not only help your patients, but patients worldwide, because it is a virtual uh, event. But we hope maybe in 2022, we can actually host a, a physical event with you as well. Thank you both so much. Thank you. And thank you for all the Arrhythmia Alliance does.